Hello, this is uh, Violet Haldane again with another one of our sessions on how government works. Uh, Christiane folks, our facilitator, today will be interviewing Mr. Tulani Legrere, who's Department Head of Human Resources, Labor Relations and Benefit Administrations for the City of Hartford. I'm gonna turn it over to Chrisanne, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Chrisanne, as you know already, but um, today I'll be interviewing Mr. Tulani. Um, so can I just kick off the interview with asking, um, what is the main responsibility or the main goal of the Human Resources Department? Sure. Well, firstly, thanks for having me. Thank you, Vila. Thank you, Chrisanne. It's nice to be with you today. And, um, you know, hopefully I can share information that answers all of your questions and um, that we can have a nice dialogue. Um, so quite simply, our, our job here within Human Resources is to work with the entire city municipal government organization um, to, in order to ensure that their personnel, staffing, and general human capital management needs are met. Um, so in large part, this deals with everything from recruitment to managing performance um, and supporting the departments and being able to execute their priorities, um, you know, enabled by having the staff that are in the right roles and oriented around those goals and the priorities of the department. How exactly did you go about getting your job? Sure. So I actually was contacted um, through the recruitment process and encouraged to apply. Um, in the context of our employer um, relationship with our employees, there are two primary categories. One would be a classified employee. The other would be an unclassified employee. If you're a classified employee or the job that you're applying to to get is a classified job. It could be either union or non-union, um, but it means you have to go through the civil service process. If you're in an unclassified role, it means that you are appointed by an appointing authority. In many cases, the mayor, many of his uh, department heads or uh, department directors are actually appointed and they exist in unclassified roles. And there's never a circumstance where an unclassified role is a union role. So it's only non-union. So in my case, because I'm actually a civil servant versus a public servant, which a public servant would be one of those appointees in an unclassified role um, versus a civil servant where you're coming through the civil service process to staff a classified job, you actually have to apply in accordance with our standard civil service application process, which then means that your application has to be reviewed um, based on your training and experience that you put forth to determine whether or not you meet the minimum qualifications for the job for which you're applying. If you do meet the minimum qualifications, then your name is added to what's known as an eligible register, and it will exist on that eligible register for a year so that if that position comes back up, you could actually get a call back without having to reapply. In some cases, uh, we don't necessarily do training experience reviews, we do testing. So in the case of, let's say, a police recruitment for an entry-level police officer, um, as long as you submitted the application materials on time and everything that was required was submitted, then you would actually be invited to take part in the examination process for that recruitment. Um, and so that's really how I got my job is I actually applied, my qualifications were reviewed against the job's minimal qualifications, I was deemed to be qualified, and then I interviewed and ultimately was offered the position I accepted it. Um, okay. What role do you play in your department? Do you hold a certain title? I do, I am the director of the department, which means I'm the head of the organization of human resources. Um, we're organized around three different primary divisions, the first of which is human resources or civil service, which is basically the kind of core um, HR practice work. Uh, then similarly, we've got labor relations, which deals with um, you know, all of the matters pertaining to uh, adhering to and upholding our negotiated agreements with our uh, bargaining units, we have seven. Um, and then lastly, the benefits administration division. Um, you know, really they support all of the benefit programs that we offer. So, you know, medical, health insurance, dental, and all of those other sorts of programs. And so my role is to basically lead the organization and to make sure that I support, um, you know, developing talent within our organization, that I support driving efficient operations across our organization. And then I make sure that, you know, our organization is stable and, and healthy so that the work that we do with all of the departments, because we interact with each department, you know, that, that 
impact would be a positive one because if we're stabilized and we're able to give them the support that they need and give them good guidance to help solve their challenges, um, then that has a rippling effect in a positive way. Let's say in the future, I want to go about getting a job with the city. How do I do that? Sure. So there are a couple of ways. Um, primarily, you just have to be on the lookout for opportunities. I mean, you'd actually have to you know, read that uh, posting for whatever the given job was. And then you have to make sure that you follow the instructions in terms of submitting an application. Now we take applications in person and we also take them online, uh, depending on the job for which you're applying. Um, generally speaking, that would be on governmentjobs.com, which you can kind of get through to the job page through our website, um, you know, hartfordct.gov, and then going to departments or uh, looking through HR, or looking at current job postings, and you'd be able to find any job that's currently being posted. Similarly, if you were to come in, you'd see those same jobs posted um, in the hallway here on the ground floor of City Hall. Um, we also have a table outside of the office where folks can grab those job postings where they can actually fill out an application and then submit one, um, whether in person during business hours, eight to five, Monday to Friday, or uh, via the Dropbox during off hours. Um, additionally, if we are open during our standard hours, someone can always come in and fill out an interest card. So if we don't have a job posted at the moment, they can actually put forth their interest to be notified when that job becomes available and then we file that. And then at the point at which that recruitment initiates, we would reach out to anybody who actually had previously provided an interest card, and then they would be notified of their um, ability to apply at that time. And to get more specific, let's say I wanted to work in the human resources department. Mm -hmm. How would I go about getting a job with that department? Sure. So the way it works, um, it works the same across all the departments. Every department for which there are classified jobs has uh, the civil service process underlying those recruitments. So whether you're applying for a job in human resources or finance, that's going to apply. So basically, you would apply for a posted job. Um, and then, you know, once that posting closed, uh, your application will be evaluated, as I have mentioned previously, um, really looking at your years of training and experience. So let's say you had applied for an entry level HR analyst role. Uh, we would really be looking at whether you meet the minimum qualifications of having graduated from a four-year um, institution or whatever the case might be in that specific circumstance. And then, you know, we would basically qualify your application and add you to the eligible register based on whatever number of years of experience um, you had. And you'd kind of be ranked, you know, uh, with all the other applicants. And then let's say you came in and your name was first or second on the eligible register because of the number of years of experience that you had. Your name would then be certified to receive a notification that you've been certified and an invitation to accept that so that you can apply um, or rather so that you can be interviewed and then um, essentially we would conduct interviews and we would ask a standard set of questions to each candidate each applicant and then at the end of that interview process we would determine who's the best fit for the role if you know that first crop of names that was certified to us did not meet the need in terms of, we didn't think that there was someone who was a good fit, then we would certify more names as we go through that entire eligible register. Do you hire people? I do get involved in um, making the hiring decisions on a regular basis, yeah. Uh, that's one of my most uh, cherished aspects of the job because identifying and recruiting talent is, is um, definitely a passion of mine. Okay, so that leads me to my next question. Um, what skills and worth ethics do you look for when hiring a future employee? Sure. So, I mean, obviously, from a skill set standpoint, that's really going to be uh, more reliant upon the specific job or the role for which you're recruiting. Um, but typically, I would name a few things that are generally going to work uh, in someone's favor. You know, having those really strong work ethic characteristics, those being, you know, a sense of personal and professional accountability. Uh, you know, the initiative and the commitment to follow through, you know, holding oneself to a standard of excellence, you know, acting as though you're your own boss in the sense of, you know, is your work going to meet your standard? And hopefully that standard is higher than anyone else's would be such that you're always working as though someone's watching because you are accountable to, you know, a strong performance and contribution. 
Um, and then, you know, really good communication skills and, and strong collaboration skills, you know, working well with others in a team environment is critically important. Um, and communication is a key component of that in terms of being able to really work through challenges that will be inevitable, communicating what you're seeing so that you and your colleagues can identify, you know, a full picture on what the needs are, and then being willing to compromise as you work to develop a solution, knowing that you might have one perspective and approach it one way, but someone might have another perspective and approach it another way. Um, but that if you need to work together, you're able to talk through what's the right approach and agree and reach consensus and move forward. Um, and then I would say, you know, a commitment and a passion for what we do. You know, our jobs are really critically important. We provide essential services. In fact, the vast majority of our employees worked every day during the pandemic because, you know, you can't be uh, working from home if you're a police officer. You can't work from home if you're in public health. Um, and what we do is we, we serve the residents and the constituent stakeholders of the city of Hartford and of our surrounding community. So what we do is we really focus on what that means, the meaningful impact that we make. We want everybody to be connected to that in a way that helps them understand that they're a piece of a whole, um, this whole city of Hartford workforce team, and that we have a service-driven mission to the constituents of Hartford and that there are people who really need the work that we do. And so we have to do it well, we have to do it consistently. Um, and we have to do it in circumstances sometimes that aren't ideal, like working during a pandemic. Um, but if we don't do that work, it's not gonna get done. And so, you know, when you bring all that together, you're, you're talking about someone coming with, you know, a high degree of character, um, high degree of accountability, you know, strong teamwork skills, and someone who believes in, in the work that we do and the importance and who stays focused on that. Um, because inevitably there are always going to be challenges but you know when you have a goal and you have a primary focus you just really stay focused on that and work through the challenges because you know it's important. How long have you been working in this department? Uh, just about a year now actually I uh, came you know last year in early April um, it's obviously now towards the end of January so I've been here under a year um, but sometimes working for the city of Hartford uh, each year feels like dog years so you know, maybe if you do the math, I've worked here a little under six years. <laughs> so for that one year that you've been working with the yeah. um, human resources department, what is that one trait that um, all your employees share? Yeah. So within the department, I would say the culture that we have really reflects a lot of what I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, we have some really high quality people on the HR team. Um, it's probably my favorite part of the job is working with the people um, that we, we have here and that we're fortunate to have on the team. I would say the common trait is hard work. Um, each person works really hard on a number of levels each day. They work hard to bring their best self to the office. You know, obviously when you're dealing with the pandemic, it's, it can be scary at times, you know, when you step out of the house you know, you have to take the right precautions to keep yourself safe, to keep your family safe and those around you safe. Um, but, you know, each person has worked to push through that. Um, when they get here, they work hard to serve our departments and to serve, you know, the folks within them as individual employees. Um, you know, they've worked hard to really get up to speed and learn quickly. Uh, many of our team actually are relatively new to the team. In fact, our department had almost complete turnover in um, 2019 and heading into 2020. Um, so we only have one person on our department who's been here um, contiguously longer than 18 months, who's full-time in our kind of core HR civil service division. And so everybody's worked to really learn quickly to support one another in learning. You know, as we brought new team members um, into the team, you know, everybody's really taking a hands-on approach, a collective ownership approach to making sure that that person is positioned for success. Um, and then, you know, really, I would say people are just good people. You know, we, we do our best to be um, good spirited, you know, obviously, and that's important. Sometimes when people come into HR, you know, they might be having a tough day and, you know, you got to be able to meet them wherever they are. But at the same time, hopefully bring them to a better place by the time that, you know, they're headed out of here. So I'd say our team is just really hardworking um, and they're all good people. Okay, thank you. That was really nice. Um, can you speak on um, the labor relations at the HR department? Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is where the city is unique relative to a lot of private employers. So my prior experience coming from the private sector um, 
you know, we didn't really have any union employees. We were all at will, which meant that um, essentially we could be let go um, for any lawful reason at any point in time. And that individually, we, um, beyond the standard company benefits that were offered, you know, a person had to negotiate whatever they were looking for um, from the organization as a solo individual. In the context of the labor relations side of things, um, that's what we call collective bargaining. So we have seven different bargaining units that are represented within our workforce. We have the Hartford Police Union. We have the Hartford Fire Fires Association, Local 760. We have uh, Local 1716. We have the Chapia uh, organization, Hamia, um, as well. And then we have the Municipal Lawyers Association, MLA, and School Crossing Guard. And each of those bargaining units represent a different type of worker. So Hamia, for instance, is the Hartford Municipal Employees Association. It's kind of a mouthful, which is why we kind of just um, shorten it a bit. But in any case, there really are managers and supervisors in most cases. And so when we talk about labor relations, what we're really talking about is what is the specific collective bargaining agreement that this particular union that I'm using as an example, Hamia, has negotiated with the city of Hartford. So that means that there are specific terms negotiated, everything from um, you know, pay rates for specific job classes um, to a schedule of general wage increases, um, you know, amount that's contributed to pay for things like medical benefits, um, you know, certain different types of leave that folks are available um, or that folks are eligible for, and other different aspects that govern the employment relationship. Um, so for instance, you know, to compare it to an at-will circumstance, if you are a job as a project manager, for instance, at let's say one of the private companies around here, um, you know, you might get offered a base salary and you don't necessarily always know what's the minimum salary that's paid in that position and what's the max salary that's paid in the, that position. And then each year, depending on your performance, your manager or supervisor might say, oh, you've done a great job. Um, and the company has funded a pool for, you know, merit increases in your general salary. And so here's an extra 2% that you'll have as your base salary um, going forward. In this case, with the Hamia circumstance, you might have a project manager role, but you would be hired at step zero, which would be the base rate for the position. You could also be hired at a higher um, step within that position, but the steps are discrete and they're predetermined in the sense that you know, you go from, let's call it 50,000 to let's say 53,000 at step one and 56,000 at step two, and then so on and so forth up to the max step. And that every year on your anniversary day, you would be due a step increase. So you would automatically go. And that was something that the union negotiated on behalf of all of its employees. So compare contrast in the private sector, you know, it's kind of you're at the mercy of your employer in what they want to give you in the sector here in the public sector where we're dealing with labor unions, um, you know, you have a lot more protections that are afforded to you through your collective bargaining agreement and the union that you belong to within that context, um, such that, you know, also when it deals with discipline and, and separation of employment, um, you know, if you felt like you were being unfairly disciplined for something, um, you would be able to grieve that with your union representation supporting you in that process in dealing with your manager or your supervisor. And then there are graduated steps in terms of, you know, if you don't agree with the manager supervisor, you can take it to the department head at a step two level. If you don't agree with them, then a step three level comes to human resources. And if you don't agree with human resources with your union support, you can take it to the state board of mediation and arbitration. And then um, an independent entity would decide, you know, who's right, who's wrong and make a recommendation of the finding there. So um, the labor relations side gets very complex because again, these are contracts that are negotiated. So we actually have to negotiate them on the front end. Um, in fact, right now we're actively negotiating a series of different contracts. Um, and so you actually have to go through the process to work with the union and their representation um, to bargain around different things of a material nature, you know, like I mentioned, salary, vacation days, benefits, payment contributions, premium contributions. And that sort of thing. And then when it's all said and done, that's kind of your source of truth in terms of if you have a question, you go there um, or you go to your union. And if you need support or you feel like the city of Hartford isn't upholding the tender bargain, then you can grieve it. Um, and so there's a lot that goes into hearing those grievances, rendering decisions and findings on those, uh, making sure that all of our 
HR processes and transactions are executed in accordance with the expressly stated terms of the collective bargaining agreement. Um, and that over time, as things change, if we need to do a memorandum of agreement or understanding on something that wasn't covered or expressly stated in the CBA, the, the actual contract, then we'll work with them around that as well, um, just on a day to day basis. I think. What jobs in the city are union jobs? There are a lot. Um, <laughs> In fact, it, we literally have thousands of jobs and the vast majority, 95 or so percent, excuse me, are actually union jobs. So everything um, from, like I mentioned, police and fire to public works, um, you know, many of those jobs are, are union jobs. Um, with the exception of, like I mentioned, you know, a small subset of jobs that are classified non-union or those um, political appointments in those unclassified roles. With the exception of those, everything else is, is a union job. What's your favorite part of your job? So I actually like working with people. Um, I used to be primarily focused on you know, business uh, management, business um, administration, you know, strategy, marketing, product development, those sorts of things. And um, I quickly realized that you know, people would reach out you know, for um, informal mentorship or even formal mentorship in some cases. And I really enjoyed it. And that there were many instances where um, someone would come back to me after we had had, you know, a mentoring relationship and they would express to me that, you know, some of the things that I had shared, um, you kind of help them get out of their own way. And as a result, they realized some success um, in their professional life that they were looking for. And I always got a lot of, um, you know, good feelings about that. And it was, I found it to be very energizing. And as I progressed in my career, I often observed how organizations don't really, uh, you know, make the most of the talent that they have because, Sometimes they view people as you know, interchangeable commodities, which is not true. Everybody has unique skills and brings a unique perspective to their job. And when you see that someone makes meaningful contributions, it's in the organization's best interest to find a way to continue to um, you know, optimize that relationship and make sure that that employee is positioned, positioned for success. And so my favorite part of the job is finding those win-win outcomes with the people who work here, because if, as I shared earlier, if the people don't show up and do their job, you know, we can't uphold our duties and obligations to the members of the Hartford community. So we rely on having a viable, healthy, productive workforce. And, you know, people are complicated. So, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, and there's a saying out there that's often used, you know, people don't often remember what you say specifically or what you did, but they always remember how you made them feel. And so when people come to work every day, you know, they might be going through things outside of work that might impact how they feel at work. Um, they might be having circumstances at work that create a challenge for them in terms of their ability to be fully productive or engaged while they're at work. And so a lot of what we try to do is find ways to um, address any root causes of friction in the workplace. Um, we also, within the benefits context, sometimes have to support an employee with what's going on outside of the workplace with things like our employee assistance program where you know they get free access to mental health professionals and other services from a work life standpoint that can help them through tough times like the loss of a loved one or um, you know a, a very severe illness or something of that sort so it's really looking at the whole person and saying okay well we need these folks every single employee all 1653 or so city of Hartford employees at the present moment we need them all to come to work and be positioned for success and supported in you know, what they need to do to be successful in their job. Uh, and you know, we have to find ways to reach each person uniquely depending on their unique circumstances um, as needed and solve whatever their challenges are so that you know, they can continue to focus on the task at hand. So my favorite part of the job is actually engaging with people and seeing a better outcome um, than we would have been able to achieve without getting involved. What are the chances of um, an employee switching from one department or transferring from one department to another? Um, it, they're actually quite high. I will, um, I will say that a lot of folks actually are long tenured, you know, with regard to, um, you know, their position here. And, and in many cases, they're long tenured in multiple different roles. So. Um, there's a lot of flexibility if someone has worked here, particularly if they have already satisfied their probationary period, which varies depending on the job, could be up to a year. Um, but that, you know, once they're a permanent employee, if they 
see another job that's posted, they can apply as a promotional employee. Um, and that would give them a uh, priority in terms of that interview process because internal candidates are uh, interviewed before external candidates. Um, we call it the external open competitive, we call it internal um, promotion. And then, you know, you can transfer similarly if you add your name to a transfer list, if a position opens up, uh, again, you get priority in terms of the interview by the hiring manager. So there is a lot of mobility and that's a primary way that we drive retention and that we retain institutional knowledge um, because someone might have worked in one department, like take my assistant director. She's worked with the city for nearly 20 years. As of this year, it'll be 20 years in September. And um, she spent the majority of her career in finance. She started at an entry level, but because of her work ethic and the type of person she is, she was able to move up um, to a management level. And she actually also was uh, a member of the executive leadership board with one of our unions, the Hamia union that I mentioned earlier. And then she decided that, you know, based on what she was seeing, you know, she thought that she could be of value in human resources. And so she applied, came through civil service and has been incredibly valuable to the team because having had the long tenure experience in the city, she knows the culture very well. She knows many people very well and has a lot of trusted relationships. Um, similarly, having had that union leadership, she understands how that labor relations interaction happens um, on the union side. And now she's learning it from the human resources side, but she's really showing people that it's not an us versus you. It's a, we need to work together because we have overlapping and shared goals. So really, you know, when you see people being able to make those sorts of transitions in their career, and in this case, seeing the success that not only the individual has, but that the organization has as a result of that individual kind of bringing their unique talents to a different side of the house. You know, it's a recognized fact that when we find ways to help people stay engaged by making sure that they're in the right roles um, and that they have mobility, that we have a higher likelihood of, of retaining that, that talent in the organization. But as I mentioned, because of civil service, there are rules that govern and dictate how people move through um, the organization. That's really to maintain fairness. Um, because a lot of what civil service does is it it takes away the possibility that, you know, just because you're a higher up's niece, for instance, or or friend or or relative um, or personal associate, that you'll just automatically get a job. And what it does is it strips away all of that and it says, you know, firstly, we have to make sure you're qualified to do that job because taxpayers are funding these positions to provide essential services. So irrespective of your color, your gender, your age, who you know or who you don't know, as long as you have the minimum qualifications for a role that you're applying for, you will have an opportunity and a fair shot at getting that, that job. Then, you know, on the back end, when it deals with who gets interviewed and in what order, like I mentioned, it's very much of a structured process that's governed by a lot of rules so that the hiring manager, when they get candidates, it's candidates that HR has already told them are qualified and that they really are just there to assess for fit within the team. Um, so in some cases, we had had situations where people were saying, oh, well, you guys are sending me people who are not qualified, and we had to push back and say, no, you might not think that they're a good fit for your team, but we have absolutely qualified them based on our standard process. So you do have to interview them, and you cannot return that cert list until you've actually interviewed each candidate. So it's very different from the private sector where people get to pick and choose who they want to interview and if you know one of their associates says hey yo my nephew wants an internship or whatever you know just hire him uh, it doesn't really work like that does the staffing reflect um the people living in the city yes so we are proud of our representation in fact um like i mentioned we have 1653 employees total um that's full and part-time as of present day. Uh, of that number, um, you know, about 30% are, are female and the remain, remaining portion are, are male. Now, why are we skewed so heavily in the male direction? Well, because we have certain departments that traditionally have been viewed as, quote, predominantly male professions, things like police, fire, public works. Now, what we're working to do in HR is make sure that we support adequate representation. So on the flip side, when it comes to 
um, representation in, in terms of people of color. Um, we do absolutely represent the community. In fact, um, if you'll give me a moment, I can tell you exactly where we stand um, with regard to representation of uh, people of color. In total, the City of Hartford workforce actually is uh, more than 60% people of color. Um, so, you know, the numbers go uh, 35 and some change percent Caucasian, uh, 29 and some change percent Hispanic, and then 27 and some change percent uh, Black or African American descent. And then we have a lot of work to do in terms of increasing representation of Asian and in, uh, American Indian um, members of the community. But by and large, when you look at Hartford's demographics, um, we do fortunately have strong representation of the people who are actually a part of the community. Um, we focus deliberately on Hartford resident recruitment. It's always preferred. In some cases, um, it's required. Um, for instance, in certain positions in public works, or at the time at which you apply to be a firefighter, you have to be a Hartford resident. <clears throat> and in some cases, with certain recruitments, they actually get preference points, like in the context of police, if you're a Hartford resident, you get points added to your um, eligible register score, essentially, which can bring you up the list in terms of priority on the interview um, slate. And so, um, in terms of people of color, we are really limited to the talent pool that you know opts in. So what we're working on doing for you know areas like police and fire, where we want to see more female representation or more representation of people of color or more representation of people who are from Hartford, we are actually working on what are the right outreach models to start to go to the places where we can find the sorts of individuals who have those characteristics or who have an interest in some of those careers and start to help them understand much like what you and I are talking about, you know, why would one want to work for the city of Hartford? Um, you know, what does it take to get a job with the city of Hartford and then supporting those folks along the way? Because if you think of something like police, for instance, we always want to see more of the community represented in police. We actually have a cadet program, which you can start um, in high school. Um, but what we, what we have to do is connect the dots to folks who are at that young age to help them understand, you know, what it means to have a career in law enforcement. You know, how do you take advantage of the cadet program? What does that mean in terms of your ability to then become a sworn police officer thereafter? And we have to start early so that over time we have a more representative candidate pool, um, and that that candidate pool would be, um, you know, the pool of folks that we would ultimately bring in through the academy. And then once they become police officers, that's the candidate pool that will ultimately um, be the candidate pool from which we will promote leadership, you know, sergeant, lieutenant, captain, and the like. And so in order to start to see better representation at leadership levels, you know, having more women, more people of color at that command staff level, we have to start early in terms of getting the talent into the organization, keeping them along the way, and making sure that they have equal opportunity for advancement um, up the ranks so that they then become eligible when those opportunities uh, are presented for them to um, actually take part in a promotional recruitment for a position like a captain or, or a lieutenant. Is the city open to employee creativity? We work on it, yeah. I mean, I think for us, we know that it's naturally a part of the equation for employees to, again, bring their, their best selves to, to the office every day in whatever capacity they work and to be engaged enough and care enough to share their bright ideas when it makes sense for them to contribute um, in the context of how the organization can continue to do what it needs to do as effectively as possible. Um, so I'll give you a case in point example. It could be something as simple as, you know, someone comes in new to the organization and, you know, they say, well, have you thought about changing this process and using more technology to automate it so that it has fewer errors and it's more efficient and more timely? And, you know, what we hope the supervisor or the leader of that department says is, uh, well, while we haven't thought about it up to now, we're glad that you presented that idea. And so let's look into what we can do. And, and that that would be, you know, an innovation in how we do our work. And that would have been driven by someone's creativity and whatever their unique vision is. Um, there are some instances where it's less readily available to us than others, because if you take something like, um, you know, police, for instance, it's highly regulated. Uh, because of the nature of the work. And so depending on the level of creativity and the idea, you know, there might be something that can be done or there might not be. But in any case, we want people to be engaged. We want them to bring their, their best selves and to be willing to share ideas 
um, you know, that stem from their creativity or, or where they see potential to innovate. And, and what I'll say is, you know, that's really the true benefit of diversity, equitability, and inclusion because, you know, the surface level dim dimensions of diversity, you know, what you look like, you know, what's your gender, blah, blah, blah. You know, that stuff is sure very visible, but the real diversity is how do you think? What are your unique ideas, your unique perspectives based on your unique life and professional experiences that could potentially benefit the organization? And that's what we really want to harness. Does management um, reflect on the city? Management does, yeah. In, in many cases, we have um, a very representative group of, of managers, particularly at the most senior level. If you look at um, Mayor Bronin's administration, he's got very strong representation uh, for from a professional standpoint in terms of people who happen to be women, people who happen to be people of color um, and, and different ethnicities. And so, yeah, I, I'm proud to say that um, by and large, we have a very representative workforce um, up to and including at the most senior level. Okay, um, thank you. Um, my final question is, is there anything about your job that I didn't ask that you would like to share? Yeah, I would. So one of the things um, that I would share for anybody, and, and we talk about it in, in the context of a lot of the focus we have here is, um, you know, holding oneself to a standard of professionalism. I kind of touched on it earlier, uh, but, you know, one of the things that's really important is that everybody, like I said, show up and bring their best self. Um, you know, we interact with the public. So, you know, you have to have a way to kind of compartmentalize and be professional at all times when you're on the job, um, knowing that, you know, people might come to you, you know, recognizing that you're in a position of authority and you've got to be able to serve and support their needs, you know, with a level and a standard of professionalism consistently. Uh, you know, I think there are times where we see certain behavior um, that, you know, is not necessarily aligned to what we really want to be presenting and, and representing as our image. And I think, you know, it starts with the individual deciding, um, you know, what kind of professional do you want to be? And here with the city, what we really need most are people who, like I mentioned, come to work, high degree of accountability, standard of excellence, work well with others, and who really care about the work that we do and who are committed to doing that because of the essential nature of it. And, and who don't get sidetracked or distracted or feel um, a sense of entitlement because they have such strong protection from their, their union representation. Um, you know, we want to be fair and inclusive and support everybody, like I shared with you, the win-win outcomes. But what we really rely on are people, of, you know, that level of character um, and, and, and those folks who come here wanting to do the work that we do, which is really important. So, you know, for anybody who's considering working for the, stand, the city of Hartford, I would say if you are someone who holds yourself to high standards, you, you want to do something that matters, that makes a difference, that's meaningful. Um, and, you know, you want to be a part of an organization um, with a long history, a long rich history, you know, you know definitely think about the city. Um, I had never really thought about working in municipal government. Um, when the idea was presented to me, I, I was intrigued, obviously, and I looked into it. And, you know, I've worked in the private sector and I've done many things that, you know, at the time for me were, were great jobs and I, I learned a lot. Um, but I would say that this is the most meaningful job that I've had. It's not easy at times, but it's very meaningful work and, and you feel good about the fact that you're a part of something um, that's not just about how much money you can make, um, but that's about what kind of community can you create um, through the different contributions that you make on the job and how those contributions um, translate to the services that, that support people in living um, you know, high quality lives um, in the community. And so you know, I, would, I would really just you know, kind of invite anybody who feels like that, that's something that aligns with their interests to really consider the city of Hartford. Um, you know, we need all the talent that we can get like any other organization. How can the people that are watching this reach you? Sure. So um, I would encourage them to, if they want to reach us, they can always do so by emailing human resources, all one word, at hartford.gov. Um, you know, that, that email inbox is monitored by our entire team. So that you're guaranteed to get a response in a timely manner. Or you can stop by. We're at 550 Main Street, Hartford City Hall uh, here in Hartford. Um, we're on the ground floor and, um, you know, we do take walk-ins. So, you know, a lot of time my staff and I are always here to, you know, answer questions that folks might have, walk them through the application process, you know, even in some cases, because we know 
you know, there is a digital divide, you know, working with someone to set up an email address and other things, if we think that that's some support that will help them as they go through um, their job search here with us. So, you know, whether it's, you know, emailing us or, or coming in, um, you know, I would say those are probably the best ways to make sure that if someone's interested in getting more information that they have the way to do so. Okay, thank you, Mr. Tulani. Chris Ann, it's been great. You're a great interviewer. Um, thank you for having me and for asking such a good question. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Have a Got good it. one. You thank too. you, Mr. Legreer. Thank you, Ms. Haldane. And we appreciate it. I do as well. Thank you for having me. And um, you know, stay safe out there. Take care. Thank you.